Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we hear the word of God found this morning in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We begin in verse 1 through 3, and then we will be moving down to verse 11. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and the legal experts were grumbling, saying this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. A certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them, and soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip for a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer do deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and he went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. And then his son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son, but... The father said to his servants, quickly bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. And so he called to one of the servants and asked what was going on. And the servant replied, your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. And then the older son was furious and he didn't want to enter in. But his father came out and begged him. And so he answered his father, look, I've served you all these years and I never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours returned, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughter the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated and let's pray. Lord, we are your people and we long to be more so. In these few precious moments that you've given to us, we pray that your spirit would do the work that only your spirit can, that you would help us to come alive once more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, the story of a child who goes to the store with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa and sees this toy that they absolutely want. It's like on the TV special side, the, the aisle at Walmart where everything you can get is for less than five bucks. But man, the way that they're asking for that treasure, you would think it was worth a million. They have no idea that his mom or dad, his grandmother or grandfather, his aunt or uncle, they have no idea that the real reason that you've gone to the store that day is because you've heard them talking about that new Lego set. You know the one, the Millennium Falcon BB-8 that's on the top shelf that has a box this big that nobody can actually afford for plastic pieces and yet, yet because you love them so much, you want to be able to share the time that it will take to put all those Legos together. You're looking forward to it. But man, if this kid would just stop asking for those $2 Pokemon cards, you know? And so all the way down the aisles towards the toy section, you walk. 
And finally, after being asked for the thousandth time, the parent, the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle, fine, I'll get you the Pokemon cards, we're gonna pick up the groceries and we'll go out the door. And the child never, ever knows what a gift he or she passed up. You and I, we laugh when we think about our children. I mean, I'm thinking of two boys right now with that particular story. But what if it was us? And what if it wasn't a Walmart or a Target or a Sam's Club store, but what if it was life? Because what happens when we try to hold on to treasures that we see, that we want, we have no idea how cheap they truly are because in the moment that we desire them, they become priceless. Everyone else in the world who has just a little bit more life experience can see that this is not the thing to hold on to and yet we go for the crown, we go for the gold, we go for whatever the goal might be. And as God is trying to offer us life itself, our hands are so full of this cheap toy rack stuff that we've got no room to receive the relationship and the time of the one who created the cosmos and longs to hold us in his hands. Jesus told a parable. He told a parable that you've probably heard once. I mean, if I'm keeping it real, you've probably heard it about 40 or 50 times. What more is there to say about the prodigal son? Oftentimes we identify with the prodigal, right? The one who runs off in some form or fashion, the one who knows that we are sinners saved by grace. We identify with the prodigal as, as those who have found our time away from church or those who might have gone off in college and early adulthood to explore what the world might have to offer. We identify with the prodigal quite easily because the prodigal is the one who gets to come home they have the party for the prodigal, and we like it when we're celebrated. But stop and think about the humility that it takes to be the prodigal. You know, this guy ran off and basically just said peace out to his father, which is like saying, you're dead to me. He took all of his freedom, and then he took it for granted when he walked off I know we don't do that in our relationships with God. We, we don't come to worship or we don't go to a Bible study or to a Sunday school class and profess what we believe and then go out into the world and live differently because it doesn't necessarily matter the same way. That's, that's the prodigal. But he did, he took that relationship for granted. He took that stuff for granted. He said, you're dead to me unless I need you. And he ran off. And it wasn't a relationship with the father that was important, it was simply what he could get from dad. But then, as stuff happens to do, it disappeared. And he found that he was staring at the pig's food wanting to eat it. Let's pause there for a second. Pigs are not considered kosher for Jews. This kid, this young man, would know that not only should he not be eating the pig's food because it's for the pigs, but he shouldn't be eating it because he had been told in the law that he shouldn't. But he was that hungry, that hungry. And then on top of that, in the country that he's in, he's not getting any food, no one's offering it to him because hospitality, according to a biblical understanding, was something that the Israelite people took seriously, but it wasn't necessarily something that all of the world took seriously. Biblical hospitality is seen more in the Old Testament than we see it in the New Testament, and it was a willingness to allow the stranger, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the immigrant, the alien, whatever translation you read, the one in need to enter into your home, into your space, and to receive what they needed in the moment, most especially it meant being willing to offer them a place 
at the table. Coming to the table, sharing food together was synonymous with sharing life because it was a time of intentional relationship building. In those moments, thousands of years ago, they didn't turn on the TV as a conversation starter. They weren't all checking their updates on Facebook over steak and potatoes. There was eye-to-eye contact, and if you were with someone you didn't know, there was that desire to try and decrease the awkwardness that they must be feeling. They weren't a visitor, they were a guest. Y'all know the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast, right? Be our guest, be our guest. Lumiere goes way over the top, and Cogsworth is trying to bring him back to reality, but who doesn't want to be a guest? Especially if you're one who is new to the culture, or new to the community, or new to the area, or new to the space, and everybody is staring at you because nobody knows your name. We don't realize what those quick glances can feel like when we're an insider, but a quick glance can feel like a long, lengthy stare. And if enough of us are making them, they can make someone feel isolated even when they're surrounded by people. Biblical hospitality was about decreasing that awkwardness even for an enemy overnight. So we see this young man who's in a different place where this culture doesn't live into hospitality and he thinks, man, I left the culture that would even open its arms to hired hands and feed them. I need to go back to the place where I no longer have any standing. I'm no longer gonna be part of the in crowd. I've severed my ties, but at least they will take care of basic needs because that's who that people of God are. That's saying something. When a young man who knows that he's gonna be a nobody, that his father might even spit upon him, and he deserves it, is willing to go back because of the culture of who the people of God are. Man, would that every church represent Christ in such a way that the people of God were a place where no one would fear walking into any sanctuary on a Sunday morning for fear of awkwardness, of a child who's a little too loud or a little too, we'll go with energetic, for another child who may have special abilities or special needs and finds that This is comforting, just a little bit of movement back and forth. Parents who may not bring kids because they might speak aloud in the middle of a service or cover their ears, or people that might enter in and look around and see that they don't share the same ethnicity or color skin and wonder, will I really be accepted beyond that first conversation? But we don't even have to go that far to know that there are people who come back seeking hospitality and instead of receiving the father's compassion and warmth, because the dad wasn't just sitting on his rocker with his feet up drinking his iced tea and then happened to see the kid from afar, wait till he got to the porch and said, all right, you can come on in. We'll have a meal ready for you in the next few hours. He was actively looking on the horizon He was actively waiting day after day for this boy that he loved to come home. And so what would it look like if those of us who call ourselves Christian, if those of us who long to be more active disciples had that kind of intentionality and that kind of heart when it comes to hospitality? You see, there was a a woman, her name was Cindy Ownby and she looks a lot like me. But because of moving around, a new job in the family, uh, she said that she and her family ended up, after a long stint of rental homes and several moves, having the opportunity to visit a large number of churches. And these were churches that had the formula of hospitality downright. 
They had the sign in for the visitors, they had the moment of welcome, they had ushers at the door, they had great signage, the grounds were nice and welcome. Uh, these were churches that, according to everything that the invitation of the, the facility or the radio announcement or the bulletin board along the interstate said, they wanted us here. So she said, we visited, but all of these churches had one thing in common. Each church we visited suffered from a hospitality gap. A hospitality gap occurs when a warm welcome shifts to a frigid silence. A warm welcome shifts to a frigid silence. The younger brother came home. The dad was waiting. But the older brother who followed all the rules, the older brother who said, I've done everything you've told me to, the older brother who was covered in the dust, not of the rabbi, but of his father, had missed one critical thing. Because while the father continued to love the younger son, even with the great insult that had been thrown at him, while the father continued to look out with eyes of compassion, waiting for the moment to slaughter the fattened calf and have a feast for his younger son's return, the older brother missed that lesson in relationship and compassion. The older brother got so caught up in doing the things that needed to be done to keep honoring the estate and the institution of the father's place that he missed the fact that he had the relationship the whole time. So his younger brother goes off and through the school of hard knocks learns humility in an awful, awful way. And then somehow finds the strength to come back. But the older brother, now it's his turn to begin the lesson of what it means to be in relationship, real relationship, and not just following the rules of how things should or ought to be. Cindy Ownby says, we experienced a hospitality gap, not just as we attended worship services, but also when we've attended church events. In every church, the attempt to welcome stops as we cross the threshold. We're greeted warmly with welcome or good morning, but then no one sought us out for further conversation, no one talked to us, we sat in silence as members and regular attendees greeted each other warmly with hugs and conversation. And she said, inside the sanctuary folks were friendly, but only to each other. Again, it's kind of basic psychology we're so very human, and from the beginning of time, we as humans have created our groups. We long to belong, and that's okay. That's part of what drives us into community. The question is, if we want to be Christians and disciples who live into, rat, who live into radical hospitality, we have to get beyond the human need to create community and then close the group off. And we have to intentionally be looking for ways to open up a section of the circle so that someone else can find their place at the table. And if church can't do it, how do we expect any other place to reach out to our young people, to reach out to the widows and to the orphans and to the foreigners and to the aliens and to the people moving into town? No, we don't want to just make it a Chuck E. Cheese show. That's not what church is either. This isn't a place just to come and have fun. This isn't a place just to come and eat food. This isn't a place just to come and have your needs met. But it is a place to experience joy. It is a place to come and be filled and be blessed so that we can reach out and be a blessing to others. And so maybe as Christians who are looking to build relationships 
to grow active disciples so that we can share the life lessons of God, maybe we've got to learn a little bit better what it means to have the next conversation. You know, I wish that Jesus hadn't stopped the parable where he stopped it, because that's when it was getting really good. The elder brother, that's the one that we have to actually figure out how to identify with just a little bit more, because that's the biggest challenge that we face as disciples of Jesus Christ. When we get so caught up in what we're doing and the cost that it will have for us, that we forget that the one who is dead might be coming back to life in front of our eyes. And we're willing to miss the miraculous resurrection for the sake of celebrating our freedom by staying outside the party. I wish Jesus would have told us a little bit more about how that older brother resolved what was going on in his soul because where the story ended is where our lesson, where it really becomes real. One of the greatest challenges that we face as a church, and I'm not just saying F-U-M-C-A, I'm saying in general as a church, is that we either lean so much into welcome that we forget that it's about God. Or we celebrate so much our friendliness that we forget that we're not necessarily being welcoming to the stranger. To be a friendly church is wonderful. It's better than being unfriendly. But we can do more. To be a loving church is great. God is greater. To be a church that is actually and intentionally looking for new relationships and opportunities to meet people and to help people know this God who has changed our lives, well, that's when the prodigal son story becomes real. So the question for us this morning is, Jesus told them a parable. Is it just a story that we love to tell the next generation? Or is it a challenge that we're willing to live into as we approach the table this morning? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you call us to come alive, and then as we experience resurrection, as we experience your glory, then you tell us it's our turn to go out and to share that same good news with others. That it's not just about us and our needs, but it's about being filled by you for the sake of a kingdom on earth that could be more like heaven. So God, in this Lenten season, help us to die to self even more, that others might know that you are alive in us, in this church, and in this community. All of this we pray in the name of three and one, amen.